Hello marketer, it's Ty here and welcome to another episode of Lane Main Marketing Teams. I'm delighted today to bring you Joel Goodsir, Head of Marketing at Inspirations Paint, a franchise with more than 130 stores across Australia. Joel was ranked the number nine CMO in the CMO 15 2020 and apart from his role at Inspirations Paint, Joel is also Chair of the University of Newcastle's External Advisory Board for Marketing. This is the first episode where we featured a head of marketing for a franchise, so we naturally dig into some of the intricacies, challenges and opportunities inherent in the role. What stood out for me is the empathy, resilience and honesty that's required in this position to gain trust with franchisees where there's no room for buzzwords or jazz hands, as I think Joel put it, and especially when you need the franchisees to co-invest in marketing campaigns, so stakeholder management and empathy becomes critical. Joel also reveals how he's changed their targeting strategy, built out their tech stack and how they've started to deliver an omni-channel CX strategy. He also discusses how he's built an e-commerce offering in the home improvement space, which is currently unrivaled. Of course, as with all our podcast episodes, we also chat about how Joel has structured his team and how he's continued to lead the charge and drive growth from approximately 90 million when he joined almost 500 million during his tenure. I love Joel's candidness and humility, and I think you're going to really enjoy listening to this episode. As always, if you hear something you love, but you're out running at the gym, doing the dishes, then don't worry, we've got you covered. When you get a moment, just head to our website, growthgenerators.io, look out for this episode, and you can download some detailed notes with all the strategies and tips that Joel shares from today. Thank you and enjoy the show. Welcome to Lean Mean Marketing Teams with Ty Hayes, where you'll hear from leading CMOs and thought leaders about what it takes to create a high-performance marketing team. This podcast is brought to you by Growth Generators, a consulting firm that helps CMOs design and build modern marketing teams that drive growth. If you need help optimizing your marketing team, head to growthgenerators.io. Now, let's get on to the show. So welcome, Joel Goodsir, Head of Marketing for Inspirations Paint to the Lean Mean Marketing Team's podcast. Hello, Todd. Very pleased to be here, Matt. Yeah. I think you're the first franchise I've had on the show, Head of Marketing for a Franchise. I'm really oh. interested today to, to dig into the intricacies and challenges and opportunities of being at the helm of a franchise. Yeah, I've been in franchises and outside of them, and it is quite different in some regards. So yeah, I'm really happy to explore that with you. Yeah, can't wait to unpack that. And I also saw recently you're in our third place currently for the BNT's People Choice CMO. So congrats on that recognition and made the CMO 50 number nine last year. So obviously shows you're highly regarded in the Oz marketing community. So well done. And yeah, I'll be keeping an eye on that, see where you finish. <laughs> Thanks mate, it's a bit of a popularity contest. Which, uh, <laughs> I'm still super awkward about it. <laughs> it's gotta, all good. Got to be in it. Got to be in it mm. to win it. All right. So to kick things off then, can you give us a brief summary of your career to date? Yeah. So my first job out of uni was with Penrith Panthers. They had 15 clubs across New South Wales and I was marketing manager at the two clubs up in Newcastle and Cardiff. And that was a really interesting kind of period because the product you were marketing was and bars and restaurants yeah. and gaming and conferences and you know, it's a really different world. It was a real eye-opener <laughs> and I was there for almost five years and then moved across to uh, what was called 3D paint stores. Yeah. Back then, I think I was 26 and I was the national marketing manager for 3D paint stores. They, they hadn't had a strategic marketing manager before that had an advertising manager. So I had yeah. this unique opportunity to kind of build it from the ground yeah. up. And that company changed names in 2007 and became Inspirations Paint Store. I've been, been there ever since. It's a crazy long time, seven and a yeah. half years, but yeah. I love it. I've been yeah. really enjoying it. Yeah, fantastic. Any learnings from being promoted pretty young to that kind of head of marketing role at 26? Did you yeah. feel ready or were you out of your comfort zone or was it, was it natural? My first job with Panthers was a marketing manager. So I was a manager straight, straight away. I didn't kind of work my way up the, the normal path. That gave me probably more confidence than I deserved. <laughs> yeah. I, I always had that motto of, you know, bite off more than you can chew yeah. into like hell. Yeah, yeah, love it. I'm thinking for this episode, uh, with your background, I thought we'd cover off three things. And one is how you've gone about designing and building a modern high performance team and throughout your career there at Inspiration Paints. And then look at, like I've talked about, those intricacies, challenges and opportunities of leading the marketing for a franchise and how your team kind of engages with the franchisee as well as the end consumers. And then lastly, which I'm sure is an interesting challenge, is how you're ensuring that single view of the customer, deepening marketing automation and enhancing CX touch points. How does that sound? 
Yeah, sounds good. Brilliant. Before we get into that, uh, maybe just give the audience a little bit more background on Inspirations Paint in terms of the size and scale of, of the operation. And Thanks, yeah. So 130 paint stores across Australia, formed in 1979 as a buying group of five stores, franchised in 97, 98. It's the first kind of franchise in the home improvement space. It has had four, it's our 42nd year of operation and has had growth every year, 42 years, which is insane and great. And so these are bigger franchises. So each store is owned by Mara and Pa Paint Store mm. owner who buy into our model. And yeah. we as franchise all really try and support them on a local, regional and national level. But the company sells about 25 million litres of paint a year. Yeah. It's a lot of paint. Oh, yeah, it is a lot of paint. Yeah. So uh, we sell mainly Dulux. We sell about the same amount of Dulux as what Bunning sells across yeah. our 375 yeah. stores. Mm. The difference is we cater to the trade professional mm. painter as well as the DIYer. Um, yeah. So it's a really weird concept where you've got to have both these very different markets in the same store at the same time, yeah. getting served in different ways. One, one's more an order taker for the trade and the other is where you're an active salesperson for the retail. Yeah. So one in every five building in Australia is, is from one of our one of our stores. So we're a very big brand and market leader in the trade and a very small brand and, and kind of um, small niche fighter in the in the retail. Yeah. Interesting. Excellent. Thanks for that background. And then with that context and understanding, then tell us about how the team has changed while you've been at the helm over the last 10 years. That's great. Thank you for having me on. So it's given me a chance to think about some of this stuff yeah. in years. And when I started as a young man with, with hair, and <laughs> brown beard, um, I, it was myself and a, a marketing coordinator and assistant. That yeah. was the, the entire team. And yeah. um, we didn't have a stores ops team. There was one guy to service all hundred plus stores wow. and it was just a different world it was it was a long time ago but as i was saying before there was no strategic marketing in place it all just been advertised a lot of what i did early on was was just building that strategy up and mm -hmm. building cases business cases to mm -hmm. um to grow up and expand and with that came an expansion of of people so various marketing coordinators as we launched our crm as we launched our internal merchandise as we launched a more sophisticated media spend and a bigger yeah. media spend with that yeah. came resources yep um so built yeah. out brilliant and in terms of the size of the franchise what was that like when you joined and how many now you said it was was it 100 ish then and 130 now is that kind of been the yeah growth? the size hasn't really changed but the configuration has so we yeah. used to be 75 percent of those stores was in regional areas okay. and we we're largely not in metro and that's kind of where the money is so mm. we're now 50 50 in metro mm. regional so a big change in shape of the stores and also just the, the caliber of mm. the franchisees. Mm. We've replaced a lot of franchisees that were looking for a succession plan with young, hungry, ambitious franchisees that really have a motor mm. and really want to grow, have great yeah. ambition. Yeah. And and we've grown phenomenally in, in that yeah. time through through those yeah. through those franchisees. Yeah. Excellent. So then what does the team structure look like now? So what are you kind of your direct reports and how's the team organized given that you've got trade and consumer, regional, metro, all these different complexities? So I have, there's 10 in the team in total, including me. I have three direct reports. Yep. To be honest, Ty, it's a little embarrassing for me because we'll be doing a restructure again in the coming period. So yeah. I know your podcast is all about the high performance teams and structuring them, but we've still got quite a traditional structure. I have basically comms, advertising promotions yeah. on one side and digital or direct on the other, yep. and then a CX report as well, and, and they have people beneath them. We have yep. a couple of in-house designers yeah. and whatnot. The days of having any name digital in any job title or as yeah. a section of your team is, is really old hat, so I put my hand up and say, yeah, that's weird and we will be yeah. changing that. But <laughs> yeah. For the time being, it has worked really well because we've spent the last few years integrating our MarTech stack, so we yeah. needed that, that digital focus. But it definitely is an evolving thing, but the 10 of us are incredibly lean to run yeah. this business. It turns over $500 million, and everyone comments when we have outside people or consultants or complementary mm. retailers or when I take a tour of 
Reese Plumbing's head office or Mitre 10's head office and I see, you know, the ages, <laughs> tables, so yeah. hundreds of people. And I look at my CEO and he doesn't make eye contact. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you're fitting the brief of a lean, mean marketing team focused on what needs to get done. And I guess part of that, yeah, is is knowing where to spend your energy, your time, your resources. As you've built up the CX capability in your MarTech, have you changed anything around what you're outsourcing and insourcing? We have definitely started insourcing more content creation, Mm -hmm. absolutely. That that seems to be a trend uh, across the board. We haven't done it in as big a way as we <clears throat> as we could have, but it's a it's a continuing thing. Yeah. So that's that started and it will certainly continue. Hmm. We still believe very much so in having a great suite of agency partners for the right reasons, yeah. for the right specialities and, and having that balance. But the focus on CX and single view of the customer has been absolutely laser sharp the last few years. Yeah. And so a lot of our technology that we've built and a lot of the research that we've done and the resulting ideas and implementations have been to, to really try and get rid of all the pain points in, in the Omnichannel and really make sure that our personalization is as useful and friendly to the consumer as, as possible. Yeah. And, and really, yeah, the single view of the customer is hugely important to us. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. I can't wait to get into that in, in a little minute. While we stay on team, though, just wondering... How do you keep the team aligned and what are maybe two or three measures you look at daily to make sure you're focusing on the right works? Prioritization's obviously got to be key when you've only got such a small team and so many stores to service and thinking about the franchising, the end consumers, the trades. What are those measures and how do you keep the team aligned and focused? One thing is have quite a, a small space where all 10 of us are in together. I don't have an office. I gave up my office for the marketing meeting room so we, mm. we have a meeting room that we can all use. And we're all just out there at our desks. And so we do talk all the time, every day. Uh, everyone knows what, they, what they're what they working on, but we help each other out a lot as well. In terms of the metrics, there is an annual franchisee satisfaction survey, and they absolutely rank, rate every department, including marketing. And the marketing department and the marketing manager in a franchise setting is typically not the most liked person. <laughs> and I'm, I'm okay with that. But we do really look at those look at those hard measures for yeah. each year. Well, obviously, and that includes an NPS and, and, and yeah. a whole bunch of other questions. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's more the soft measures that I'm really interested in. And, and I love the contact you have with franchisees. Mm-hmm. I'll never forget our 2013 conference when we relaunched mm-hmm. Inspirations Paint. And, and I had one of them come up to me and say at the, at the National Conference in Sydney, he said, this is the first time... I've felt the brand was strong and I've been proud to have it on my chest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, okay, that's a yeah. measure. I want, yeah. I want that. I want every yeah. franchisee to feel that. And so we do, yeah, really strive for that. Yeah, excellent. And before we get into, I guess, some of those intricacies of being ahead of a marketing for a franchise and dig a bit deeper into that, what are you most proud of? Well, what, what initiatives do you think will have the greatest impact in terms of recent yeah, initiatives for the franchisees and the customers over time? There's a lot. I mean, uh, <laughs> we go back to in 2011 to find out our purpose and, and position and guiding philosophy. And we had a great agency called the Brand Council with Reg Bryson, who's a guru of the advertising industry in Australia. He, he was the guy that founded the Campaign Palace in 1980. Wow. Yep. It's a legend. He brought Apple to Australia. He yeah. brought Krispy Kreme Donuts to Australia is, is a legend, Reg. So he helped us with our defining our purpose and values and coming up with the guiding philosophy of personal attention to your painting project. And we still use that to this day. And it's just given us what Reg calls a big arrow. So we all know we're going that way. We know what it looks like. We know what it tastes like. And yeah. we're reminded to keep on strategy and not get distracted. Yeah. Yeah. go down the rabbit hole. So I'm most proud of that. This is very candid, but I remember someone high up saying to me, oh, Joel, we didn't know if you'd make it through that process because <laughs> it's a whole change in yeah. marketing. And, yeah. and I was like, yeah, I, I got that vibe at the time, but <laughs> I was actually really yeah. into it. I love yeah. that whole process. And yeah. it's given us such a great foundation. So yeah. everything comes off that. You know, yeah. everything we've done in the last nine years mm. comes from that big arrow and still mm. today. Mm. Yeah, it's fantastic that it's 
stood the test of time. It's always a sign of a great strategy and also of a confident marketing leader and not to want to reinvent the wheel every three to five years to go off in a new direction, but to go, no, our strategy is still sound. We're measuring it. Everything's tracking in the right direction. So let, let's keep going in that direction until the measures shift or something tells you you need to go in a different direction. So yeah, yeah. well done. Okay. So then switching gears a bit to the intricacies of, of marketing a franchise. So starting with what do you love about it? What do you love about marketing a franchise business? I feel like this is going to sound probably conceited, but I feel like it's the most difficult test of the marketer to go, yeah. all right, your customer, not your consumer, the end consumer, they're great, you've got to deal with them as well, but your customer, mm. they're these group of 100 people, and they don't know anything about marketing, and they think most of it's bullshit. Yeah. So market to them every day and convince them to give you money to market <laughs> yeah. your joint consumers. And it's so tough. I taught marketing as a sessional lecturer at various universities for about six years, hmm. Macquarie, UTS, mainly at the University of Newcastle. And the students are receptive, they're sponges, they want to learn. And our franchisees, not so much. You know? <laughs> yeah. So you, yeah. they will call you out on any ball dust. They will call you yeah. out on anything that's... So I've started to develop techniques. You know, I don't use the word brand. We don't yeah. use the word brand. The yeah. brand is almost like a poisonous word yeah. because they think it means something fluffy and expensive yeah. and useless. It's always about the organisation, the business, the company. Yeah. Um, it's a massive challenge, which I love. Sometimes mm. it feels like you're banging your head against a brick wall and mm. other times you get this feedback that I was referring to earlier where they say, look, we trust you guys at head office. You know what you're doing with the marketing. Mm. got my money. I mean, just go mm. for it. And that's really rewarding. Yeah. It tests your customer centricity, doesn't it? Because you've got to have it on both fronts. Like you need to really deeply understand the franchisees and what they're interested in and the right way to communicate and negotiate and get them on board, but then make sure that what you're suggesting reaches the end goal of the consumer. So it's, it's almost two Time. levels of customer centricity there. That is such a good point because if you let your external comms be comms that your franchisees like, you will fail instantly. Mm. Like if you creating messaging and comms for your franchisees, it just will end in tears. The customers yeah. will hate it because yeah. and I, <laughs> I have this SpongeBob SquarePants meme where he's yeah. standing under the sea with a rainbow and it just says, nobody cares. <laughs> yeah. And I've been known yeah. to show it to franchisees going, hey, no yeah. one cares that you have a shop full of half moon bucks with paint yeah, you have seven yeah. staff and you have yeah. color wall and 17 brands of perks. <laughs> Yeah. They, they couldn't care less about yeah. that. So um, yeah. if I make the ad for you, they will hate it. So I'd rather yeah. make the ad for them and convince you not to hate it. And yeah, challenging. So then I guess that, that may be one of the challenges, but what else is uniquely challenging about it compared to a typical B2C or typical B2B role? Yeah, I just think you have to win hearts and minds, but you have to win the business side as well. And it's a mm. very... Um, operational, blokey, mm. hardware in the environment and a lot of the people have been in the game for a really long time. So mm. you have to prove things work. You can't mm. just do a good sparkly jazz hand sales job. Mm. Um, you can once, yeah, maybe twice, but not the yeah. third time. And after seven yeah. and a half years, <laughs> yeah. no, they don't want yeah. to yeah. Yeah. see through that. So you've got to prove that stuff works, which is hard because, as you know, in marketing and business, we want to fail fast and learn all the time. Mm. What worked one year won't work the next. And so it's really hard to promise that something's going to work mm. every time. Because it yeah. won't. Yeah. So, so it's getting that balance right. And I guess for us, where every marketer's budget's not big enough, right, I'm sure. Mm. When we're in this environment going up against some of the hardware competitors mm. that mm. we have whose budgets are of a magnitude of, you know, 20 times more. Yeah than ours it just teaches you to obviously strategic but but just really narrow and laser sharp in, in your yeah. focus of where you're going to allocate resources and that's true of anyone not necessarily of a franchise but the mm. difference in a franchise is part of the money is their money yeah so you kind of got to got to convince them every time right and our fees aren't huge so we have to go to them cap in hand on top of just their normal marketing fee which is super small compared to most mm. franchises and go can you throw in some more and here's why so we joke that we have to do this caravan of courage every year around the country begging for money, but it's not its not like that, is it? Because it's not about being a cost center, it's about being the growth um, mm. yielder. 
And so, and so we talk about it as what investment do we jointly want to make in the Adelaide market or in the Rockhampton market, mm. or the Perth market, mm. and we jointly make that investment, mm. which is good because we're not going to throw our money in unless we're happy with yep. and have control over the, the yeah. strategy and the spend. But it's just so very much harder than just going, oh, here's my budget, execute. Yeah. Go, here's my budget, sell, beg, crawl, demonstrate. <laughs> yeah, potential <laughs> ROI, what's in it for you? Yeah, it's not, not dissimilar. I've worked in similar organisations where it's a little bit either gone from fully decentralised to have and spoke to centralised. But I think having a bit of skin in the game both sides is beneficial because it means mm. you're always looking at that ROI and always making sure that you've got the best interests, especially in your case, of the franchisees and each one of them as to how it's going to deliver a return. And you've yeah. thought through, you've used your insights, your analytics to know well, this is our best bet. And with the money that we've got, we want to go into this and, and um, we think you should come with us. You mentioned the caravan kind of tour to engage with them. But how does your team keep engaged with the franchisees? Like, do you have certain roles that are responsible for that? Or is this you or how do they keep in touch with them? Yeah, that's a great question. It's so important and we never do it enough, but we try and do have lots of touch points of communication with the franchisees. Some of them are one-way communication via our internet, via our monthly sales planners and via our quarterly magazine and all those one-way communication methods. But with our franchisees, the, the best method is just picking up the phone and, and just, just having a chat, even if you've got nothing to say to them. Hmm. How's business? Talk to me. Hmm. Let them then. What's going on for you at the moment? What's happening in the market for you locally in Dubbo or in Mornington or Hobart? Yeah. So that's number one. And with some of my younger staff, because I, I used to be the young one, but now I'm the rusty <laughs> old one, um, I have to convince them to yeah. don't email them. Yeah, ring yeah. them. Ring yeah. them. They want, yeah. they want you to call yeah. and have a chat. And don't ring before 10 because they're busy with 50 trade customers. Ring yeah. Them. Yeah, uh, and so that's number one. But we also have a franchise advisory council, which I mm. highly recommend. In mm. every franchise mm. should have. So it's made up of um, five franchisees who are the who are the um, conduit between us and their constituents and mm -hmm. around them in their state group. Uh, they that it's not just them giving their ideas; it's them speaking to their constituents and feeding back ideas. Mm. And they don't get to decide. And they don't get to vote. Uh, they get to recommend. But it's really mm. a sounding board. We throw stuff past them. They help guide everything, mm. promotions, uniform changes, comms, content, everything really, store design, the whole, mm. the whole bit. We run things past them and, and they tend to be the really good operators as well. Yeah. Some of them will represent small regional stores. Some will represent big metro city yeah. stores. And, and so when we're planning a buy-in, they'll be like, oh, guys, come on, that's three pallets is too much for the store in Kalonga, mm. look, you know. Mm. Whatever it is. So, yeah. Yeah, so the Franchise Advisory Council is great. I do still hit the road a lot and travel, as does my yeah. CEO. You yeah. know, and press the flesh and take them to dinner and you know, it's always yeah. what happens outside of the meeting, which is yeah. the important stuff, which is why things is great, but you mm. don't get the water cooler chat. Yeah. You don't get the beer at the pub chat. But they yeah. tell you really what's going on. Oh, I just bought a yacht. I'm getting divorced or I have a gambling addiction or, you know, yeah. or business yeah. is booming and I've got yeah. some extra money I want to open another store. They won't say that on a team's meeting. No, no, of course not. So yeah. we still like to travel a lot. So I'm loving that it's kind of over the back up. Yeah. And is there some kind of conference or place where they get together pre-COVID or something? Yes, Yeah. absolutely. The conference is a, is a hallmark piece for us. So yeah. the next one will be in May 2022 and we... I ran the first one in Darwin in 2004. It was loose. It was, uh, <laughs> people still talk no about doubt. it. No doubt. Five people yeah. were hospitalised. Oh, wow. Days. It was wow. Good, good times. Wow. But no, the national conference is huge. It's really big for us and everyone gets together yep. and the suppliers come and, and we really get to set out the strategy and have great workshops and chats yeah. and mm, awards. That's, and all. that's a benefit to the franchisees, isn't it? It's not just the marketing support that's provided from the centre, but it's the network of other franchisees that they can build trust with, learn from, share stories, you know, what's yeah. working. Yeah. And we, you know, we... To franchises, we, isn't it? Because they're, they're willing to share because it's less competitive, you're part of the same group. Definitely, definitely. So for some of them, it's their annual family holidays, the conference, because yeah. they can't get away from the store. In some cases, other franchises are huge and they have 27 staff and whatnot, but that conference is big for that. And we're trying to encourage things like breakout groups for 
guys and girls under 40 yeah. who are a franchise and get all the yeah. young peeps together yeah. and, and yeah. women of paint, they get together yeah. and they're like, we actually run the show. Yeah. <laughs> talking and so you know um yeah. that's that's all really beneficial yeah. as well conferences is, is key wow there's been a lot covered in this interview so far as a marketing leader we know you like to spend more time taking action and less time taking notes so We've got you covered. We packaged up all the tips, strategies, and resources from each episode into some beautifully crafted notes just for you. Not ugly AI-generated transcripts, but real notes taken by a real person on our team. To grab the notes, head on over to growthgenerators.io, look out for this podcast episode, and download the notes. But be quick, they're only live for a few weeks after the episode airs. Now, back to the show. Okay, well, thanks for that, Joel. I think we might now switch over to the, the final section before the Fast Five, and it's it's related to what we we're just talking about, and it's how you're going about building a single view of the customer and what you've been up to in the CX and marketing automation space. So I understand you've recently kind of pivoted on your targeting strategy. Can you tell us about the process you went through and what you've discovered? Yeah, so we, we've always had the retail side of the business, DIYs and the trade side of the business quite separate. And basically 100% of the comms that I've done for years has been targeted at DIY because it's more profitable. Mm. And the trade, it's a very mature market and it's been a B and we're the market leader. And so we do a lot of comms in that situation. It's more about, you know, the reps you have on the road and the relationships yeah. at the door level and, and all that kind of stuff. So it always been DIY, but we, we kind of shone the spotlight on this group that are in the middle. So they're not professional painters and they're not DIYers. They're kind of business customers that um, aren't painters but buy and use paint sometimes. Okay. Uh, they, might, yep. so they might be builders or they yep. might be handymen, plumbers, yep. plasterers, landscapers, roofers, all those people. Mm. And it's, painting's not their main gig and they probably don't want to do it, they don't like doing it, they probably normally get a painter to do it. Mm. But sometimes uh, yeah. they paint and when they do, um, we want them to come to us and not to not to the competitors, obviously. Uh, so we've just kind of pivoted a little bit to not not stop marketing to to our DIY segments, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, but just to be less exclusive of these mm. other customers. Mm. Um, not necessarily be totally inclusive, but just be less exclusive and and start to realise that hey. What's happening in your store is you've got both sets of customers standing in the same store at the same time. Yeah. So why do you have to separate them in your comps? Because if they're going to have that experience in the store, you yeah. might as well have that experience. So it's taken a while for us to get our head around, but we're calling it a pivot. It's not a new segment. We've been serving them forever. Mm. Um, but if you look at our latest campaign, it's called our, our it's confusing for marketing people because our campaign is called Recall, but it's about recalling as in remembering, not recall as in how you <laughs> Product, measure yeah. ads. Yeah. So we do recall measuring on an ad campaign called Recall. It's very good. Yeah, okay, yeah. But you'll see in, in that campaign that there's some tradey-looking dudes in there, yeah. not just DIYs, blokes with tool belts on and, yeah. and stuff like that. And so just yeah. pivoting a little bit because they're an important market and no one really owns them and everyone's trying to own them. Mm. So we, we launched a new multi-program just in November last year to, yeah. called Paint Edge to yeah. target those kind of ABN holders and business people. Mm. It's going quite well. Yeah, excellent. And what other impact has it had on the way you go to market? Yeah, well, look, I, I guess it kind of affects everything because now that we have e-commerce and now that we have a whole set of different touch points, you need to account for all the customer types in those mm. on those mm. platforms and in those touch points. So you can't just start a lobby program. They've got to have their own login to the website and they've got to have their own role and see different pricing on the website. And yeah. they've got to have different workflows in your marketing automation and different messaging and a different art direction. It's, it's a whole thing now. You've got to think very holistically, I guess, when when you're making what is seemingly a, a quick and easy change. It's, it's yeah. really not at all. Yeah. And maybe zooming out to the customer journey, because I'd be interested, obviously, well, I'm guessing it's quite different from the tradie to the DIYer to this person in the middle. So have you done that detailed customer journey? And even with 130 plus stores, millions of customers, getting that single view of the customer and the experience between online and in-store, yeah, it must be so challenging. How have you gone about getting that single view and optimizing that CX for these different customer segments? 
That's a great question. So I remember sitting on a park bench with my CEO after a meeting in like 2009 Mm -hmm. and I just kind of had this image and I was explaining it to him. We wanted to be able to know what the customer had done online and offline. Single view of the customer did not exist at the term of 2009, right? And neither did the marketing technology stack and neither Mm. did marketing automation and neither did CX. It wasn't a thing. So none of those things existed, but I'm sitting on this park bench explaining to my boss that let's have this thing where wherever the customer touches us online or in store, we know who they are. We know what colors they painted in Jenny's bedroom. We know how often they buy. We know if they've got an online account or not, and we can send them comms based on their purchases that are relevant mm. and useful at time. He's like, yeah, mm. cool. Can you do that tomorrow? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, no problem. And it's taken, it's taken 11 years yeah. later. We're sitting here with a fully integrated marketing technology stack where mm. we don't spam people anymore. We send mm. them project notification reminders. Hey, you painted your deck with this can of this brand in this mm-hmm. color three years ago and uh, here's some content to show how you need to prepare your deck if you're going to paint it again. And here's the product you use and here's an offer that you can come in this month. And it's really <laughs> nice to see that come to fruition. Yeah, yeah we've built the, the stack and, and it's all fully integrated and mm. um, it's just been a hell of a lot of work. I bet. And, uh, you know, but, I say to marketers who are thinking about a career in yeah. marketing these days, Get a double degree in marketing. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's the double degree. In Absolutely. The marketing technologist is such a crucial role these days, isn't it? Mm. So what did you learn then? I mean, what does your stack look like now? And what learning can you share with others about to embark on this? Like where you went wrong and what? Well, the number one thing is don't believe what the marketing automation people tell you that their, their um, platform can do. And it goes for all of them because I've spoken with so many marketers. It doesn't matter what they're using. Mm. Marketo or sales or sales or yeah. masters or whatever. Mm. And so we're happy with, with our marketing automation platform, but it's been a hell of a lot of work to get it to do what we wanted it to do. We have this complication that our uh, CRM is in our ERP, but it's customized heavily because it's got to record the colors you used in every purchase yeah. you've made for the last 10 years, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's certainly 100,000 colors yeah. and half strengths and combinations. And, Custom yeah. colors. And yeah. So, yeah, it's been pretty full on. But, yeah, marketing automation we use mainly for email and, and SMS marketing, but also creating lists that power a lot of other a lot of other stuff. Obviously, it's linked to our uh, ERP, our CRM, our point of sale, our website. We went full live e-commerce in December 2019, and we're still the only national paint company or any company where you can buy paint online in any color and any brand most paint store chains don't have e-commerce at all the hardware ones have it and they have a fairly weak collection and delivery promise and they have a really poor color selection tool so i'm really proud of ours because it's awesome two hour click and collect nationally ticketed and ready um and next day delivery so cx parts we use us nicely for post-purchase um, satisfaction mm-hmm. measurement. We started with Trustpilot just this year and I've got a 4.9 out of 5 mm, score after right. about 600 reviews. And everything's just getting integrated and I've got a fabulous digital marketing manager who owned his own digital agency for 10 years and I poached him and he's brilliant. So we're well on the journey, but it's, it's seemingly never, never ending. Yeah. And did you get many implementation partners to implement all the different stacks like just the team related to the stack but separate implementation partners and what was your experience like with that well that, that's the other thing that you don't learn we did marketing automation in 2017 hardware is often late to the game you might have some listeners going we did ours in 2012 but hardware industry can take a while to catch up but yeah 2017 and you know, i was gobsmacked that the platform you buy doesn't integrate and you have to get a third party integrates like me Serious? Okay. I, th- I was blown away by that. So, yeah, we used a good mob in Melbourne called Sinks and they, they did all our integration for us. But we've done some in house, we've done some with our ERP system. The integration hasn't been. And what about the training and implementation? So, it's one thing to have the tool, it's the other thing to upskill the team and actually learn how to drive it. How have you done that? Because I know that's a big challenge where, you know, CMOs 
buy the stack gets sold all the bells and whistles and then you know we end up using 10 or 20 percent or it comes time for renewal and we we go how do we get the most from this system yeah definitely absolutely have to put my hand up and say we've been guilty of a bit of that we've had lots of workflows in place since day dot four years ago but there's so many more we want to do how i guess we've done it is is we've had only three of us really across that and so we all share our our learnings um, with Mm. each other we're guided a lot by this fabulous in-house guy we've got if anyone poaches him off (laughs) come come after you yeah so what we've had to do is just a massive education piece to stores as well to go here's a promotion it doesn't start on this date and finish on this date. It just goes forever and it gets yeah. triggered when someone hits this yeah. logic work. It's called it. Evergreen. Have you heard of yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. And they're like, what? When does <laughs> it finish? What's the code? No, no, there's yeah. no code. They yeah. will just come in and say, I have earned a such and such. And you'll look them up and the such and such will be there. And you just give it to them. Like, yeah. Okay. It's magic. Start yeah. at the beginning. How does yeah. this work? Yeah. And so what we've developed is a menu. The mm-hmm. stores. So we go. Here, here's the menu of promotions that can be live for you. Tick the ones you want to be live, and we'll make them live. But they have to commit to a minimum six month time period for it to go through, and for us to be able to then report on it for the store and and show them the efficacy of that style of promotion. Or could be any number of consumer journeys: a thank you, a reward, a promotion, content, whatever it might be. But they yeah. select on the a la carte menu and. Yeah, and we report back to them. Yeah, fantastic. Well, no easy feat to put that in motion. I can understand why it's taken ten or eleven years. What have been the results that you've started to see from that? Both, I guess, the e-commerce implementation and just the whole CX implementation. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I didn't mention the CX thing, but we did a, a full trade and retail journeys a few years back, and, and really honed in. We used Strativity for that. They're a great agency, you know, those guys. But um, yeah, come. Brad Mead and yeah, George Bench, they helped us really come up with the desired memory and the desired emotion for each stage, for each market. And interestingly, the desired emotion and memory is actually quite similar. They want to be respected. They want to be, they don't want to be condescended, um, took down to and all, all these kind of things. So that was really, really useful. The thing I guess that we've been doing in the last year, which has been so great, is taking some wonderful insights from consumer research, we use the navigators in the rocks, uh, have been using them for eight years, they're brilliant. And um, they know our business so well. And so they've profiled our segments and got us a really good shape and we feel we know the segments really well, established all the pain points. And so we did a three-pronged program to really fix the pain points in store, online, and then appeal to the pleasure points, if you like, through new comms. So, Never before have we kind of integrated our advertising and brand ads with our e-commerce website and the structure of it, and we've changed the structure of our stores so they're all aligned. Um, so for us, it was all about showing people corporate hardware competitors zig went into zag. So we realised that we need to play in the space where they really don't, and it's in a lot of the niche projects you know driveways and boat paint and pool paint and car paint and wood care and specialty and and what it does is it shows our credentials as a specialist um, and it separates us from the big box hardware guys so the new ads they're all about showing those various projects and our expertise in them and our website is set up as the same main nerves across the top and our new floor plans and our new cfx stores stands for customer first experience it's the name of our store upgrade program they're the same base a uh, hero as soon as you walk in marine wood care auto especially and they're the high margin so the high margin so they make us more money they back up our specialist credential it just gives the customers a better experience we hear this new soundbite in our schools is oh i didn't know you did that oh i didn't know you did that um because for years we just talked about wall paint, bedrooms, lounge rooms, two most painted rooms of the house. Now we hardly talk about them at all. It's all about here's yeah. some heat reflectant paint for your motorbike petrol <laughs> tank, and here's yeah. some ma- magnetic paint for your daughter's you know, yeah so, yeah. Um, yeah, I did notice that actually when I was looking at your website. I thought that's interesting. Yeah, that you, that you do all of that, and I imagine just that consistency from online to in store just makes 
purchasing so much easier and your experience in stores so much easier because I think we've all got lost in some of the larger hardware stores going, where do I find what I need to find? Um, so to have that synchronicity from online to in-store, you can see how that would just create a much, much better experience. It's a huge project. We've just about we've come out of prototyping. We've done four stores. We're about to go into rollout, um, hundred plus stores in the next three years, and it's very the the results we did pre and post research intercept interviews and whatnot with customers, and and the post results on the prototype stores are amazing. We've cured ninety plus percent of the pain points, and people at stores come in. There's a decompression zone. You can find your find your space. There's um, wayfinding, signage and color coding, everything's by category now, not by brand. We used to have nine ceiling whites in six different locations. Now we just have all the ceiling whites together in order of premium. This price is show. It's not rocket science, but again, hardware takes a while to catch up. So. Yeah. Yeah. Other industries. Love it. Okay, Joel. Well, before we get to the fast five, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and there was 19 reviews that you've received. Obviously, uh, having a big impact in those People's Choice CMO Awards. So before we get to the fast five, I'd just love to know, yeah, are there any leadership lessons or insights that have helped guide your career? I kind of have this thing about brutal objectivity. So it probably ties into the SpongeBob meme I was telling you about before, but I, I will not ever let the halo effect or group think come in to the team or the management team. And so I'd always start from the basis of nobody cares about who you are or what you've got to sell. <laughs> yeah. Build from there. Yeah, so I, yeah. I'm really happy to admit when we mess up, when things are bad and, and admit to see us at our worst. Um, I don't sugarcoat anything, I guess. Kind of tell the other departments too that like no one's opinion matters except for the customer, you know. And, and the things I'm trying to tell you, they're not my ideas or opinions, they're things to solve a customer issue. So I guess that leads into become a very empathetic person and, and empathy, I think, is just such a critical thing for marketers because it's not about you, it's about the customer and, and you, you have to be, I'm the voice of the customer in our group, so I've got to like fight for them, so I've got to know them. Uh, you're a fellow marketer, you get all this, but... I think it's just critical to have that objectivity and the empathy kind of kind of hands in hand. And I'm really hands on. I'll drive the bloody hire truck to the TV shoot, all the furniture that we borrowed from Freedom, or I'll get my hands dirty. And and so my staff, the team sees that and, and knows that I'll muck in, and I'm not just going to delegate everything. Um, but I think have, having been around for so long as well. I've got a long-term focus. If there's an issue that's a red-hot poker now, I know that it's going to die down and I'm thinking about what can we implement that's going to actually stick and work in, and you know be measurable and demonstrable into the long term so I don't get distracted by shiny gadgets so much. Yeah, all, all important. Love that, the kind of radical transparency and keeping the team focused, rolling up your sleeves. And I think that Again, coming back to the industry that you're in, where your franchisees will call bullshit, has probably played a yeah. part in that. That you just have to say it how it is, and if you don't know something, you say I don't know it. We'll look into it, and being guided mm. by the customer insights and research is, is great lessons. Have you had any um, mentors that have played a key role throughout your career? Yeah, yeah, I have. Look, some really good ones. One was uh, one of my first marketing lecturers at. University of Newcastle was Phil Morgan. I think I wrote a little piece about him on LinkedIn. And he's our speaking to him just this, this weekend. He's a legend he's in his 70s now. But he had his own marketing consultancy for 40 years called Grassroots Group. He was lectured at you know, various universities, UTS and, uh, in Sydney and Newcastle, Macquarie and whatnot. And he was a marketing manager of a national chain as well back in the day. And obviously he had Italian restaurants as well. Yeah, so this, this guy's a legend, right? He's done everything. He loves services marketing, which I do too, and he loves the place P um, supply chain, which I do also. So he's just been an incredible mentor to me. The other one was Simon Burrett. He, he was the owner of the Foundry ad agency in Sydney that I had back in 2007. He's now head of marketing for uh, Harris Scarf in Melbourne. It's just a legend. He's been really good. And I think third would be Mark Ritson, who I've had a bunch of touch points with and, and had him speak at our conference and, and I'm able to message him occasionally and say, hey, this is our issue. I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think? And he'll write back, 
you know that's the right answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's uh, also um, straight straight talking and could use some <laughs> radical transparency. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So, the, yeah, those three have been um, brilliant, brilliant yeah. standing boards, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, before we get to the fast five, obviously 18 years is fantastic innings with one organization. What keeps you inspired and what are you looking forward to next? Yeah. Well, look, I, when I started with the film, we turned over 90 million and now it's more like 500 million. So that's pretty inspiring. Yeah. Uh, I like the growth. And and uh, I guess I feel like, I don't know, because I am did a master's in marketing and I've taught marketing and I teach MBA students and I'm like, market is so into marketing i kind of want to do it really well and i know that we don't like we're not the benchmark but i'm i'm inspired by that to just up the game up the game to keep you know in a bit of a laggard industry and uh, i feel like we can be a bit pioneering in home improvement and still be kind of look, look down the pyramid from the fmcg top of the pyramid but you know, that that really inspires me. But also the relationship, incredible agency relationships going on seven, eight years. And I really trust those people and, and I know they have the company's best interests at heart and I just really value those those relationships. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'll keep an eye to uh, see what happens next with Inspirations Paint, but obviously you've taken it, yeah, succeeded huge growth there and um done a lot in the CX space and automation and having a big impact. Congrats on that. We are now down to our fast five. Are you ready? I am not ready. Go anyway. <laughs> so what do you believe are three essential capabilities or criteria of a high performance marketing team? I think there needs to be a lot of harmony and trust within the team. I think if there's things getting in the way of that blockages, that can really destabilize a high performance team. So we need to keep the Communication channels open. Yep. Any others? Got harmony and trust. I think listening and empathy and not just being a one-way communicator, I'm really big on that. And just reaching out to people for no with no agenda and for no reason just mm. to hear where they're at. Okay. And how would you describe your team's culture in one word? Well, again, this is quite conceited, but we actually refer to ourselves internally within our department as Team Awesome, and uh, I'm sure the other departments hate us for saying that. But, yeah, we, we really do get along and, and believe in the work we're doing, so, yeah. Yeah, so I think I reckon we're pretty awesome. What's wrong with awesome? That's great. Love it. And what is one metric that you've successfully used to track and measure team performance? Yeah, I think that, that annual... Franchise survey, yes, is the key yep. one, yeah. You yep. just can't hide. There's nowhere to hide. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. And what's one skill or capability you've learned recently you wish you'd learned earlier in your career? Oh, that's a hard one. Drive the forklift. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't hit anything with it, did you? <laughs> I, I wore my hard this best time. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. And what book or books have you read that you found yourself recommending to others or you think our audience would gain value from? Yeah, it's purple. Uh, it's building distinctive brand assets. Oh, what's the lady's name? She's from the Ehrenberg Bass Institute. It was one of the follow-ons from Byron Sharp's book, How Brands Grow. So, yeah, building distinctive brand assets. It's got an owl on the front. It's purple. And she's fantastic. And it's a really, really great book. So, highly recommend. Excellent. We'll put that in the show notes and, um, right, yeah, put the author in there as well. So, thank you for that. So before we uh, leave off, where can people get in touch with you or find out more about yourself or Inspirations Paint? Yeah, definitely on, on LinkedIn. I really like LinkedIn as a platform. I have some great conversations on there. So hit me up, Joel, Joel Winter. And for Inspirations Paint, yeah, on our website, inspirationspaint.com.au. Um, look us up. Fantastic. Well, Joel, thanks so much for your time. Love learning about some of the intricacies and challenges of uh, yeah, being at the helm of a franchise business, learning about your journey with CX and automation and, and how you've created that omni-channel experience and how you've continued to, I guess, drive results for the business over a long time. So I think there were lots of lessons in it for our audience. So thanks once again for your time. Thank you, Ty. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Lean Mean Marketing Teams brought to you by Growth Generators. To say thanks, we've packaged up all those tips, strategies and resources into some beautifully crafted notes just for you. So you can spend more time taking action and less time taking notes. 
To grab the notes, head on over to growthgenerators.io, look out for this podcast episode and download the notes. But be quick, they're only live for a few weeks after the episode airs.